There are fewer than 30 men in the world qualified to drive Formula One. A mere half dozen, perhaps, to win. At this moment, I'm inclined to think you're not one of them. Welcome to F1Weekly.com. My name is Clark Rogers. I'm the host of the program. I'll be joined by Nasser Hamid, my co-host. This is podcast number 1023, December 18th, 2023. Nasser. Thank you, sir. I say slings and arrows at the top. Lando lands Lorenzo Bandini Award and kick him under up, kick him under down. We shall explain gladly. Back to you. Thank you, Nasser. On today's program, the FIA heavyweight fight has begun, ladies and gentlemen. Max, he's showing some interest in being an F1 boss in the future. Ferrari launch date announced under secret code 676. Fernando knows 2024 is his last big shot. And Sauber's team name, not really worth mentioning or repeating at all. And this week's interview, we've got Lando Norris at Daytona, and Nasser will have all the details. And just a reminder, everybody, we do need your contributions to keep this program on the air. Just click on the support your favorite podcast.com. You know, you want to. Nas, welcome to the studios. I know you're getting ready for the holidays. You're a traveling man. You're all over the place. How are you? I am doing very good, sir. Thank you. Uh, Still uh, some time, a few weeks, before the Tore releases me so I can go back to FLA. So I am grounded in Frederick, uh, Maryland, surrounded by the love of my two sisters. So that's very comforting. And really, really looking forward to any motorsport. So I'm eagerly waiting uh, for the Dakar Rally, the Daytona 24 Hours. And uh, so, you know, it's all looking good. It's all positive. And also have some big travel plans uh, next season. How are things on the left coast? Apart from being very lefty. Well, yes, uh, we do have Gavin Newsom. But yes, everything's wonderful in California. We got some rain. And which is always good news in California. Everything is joyous and in a holiday, festive kind of way. That's good. And so we have to have something going on during the absence of motorsports and during the off season. And what could be better than thieves and infighting in the temple, the presidential debate, as I call it, war of words, surprise, surprise, between former FIA president Jean Todd and current President Mohammed bin Sulayem has broken out. Ben Sulayem had stated last year that his first order of business upon taking office at the FIA was to deal with a $20 million cash deficit, which was news to me, and with an unexpected legal case involving a patent dispute over the Halo cockpit protection device, which was also news to me. Now the ex-Ferrari team manager has come out with a Louisville slugger claiming charges against him are le bullshit and expressing disappointment in the portrayal of his legacy. Todd said in an interview with a French publication and I quote, This was a lawsuit brought in Texas by an engineer who owned a patent that was only valid in the United States and for a short time. So when I left, there was nothing secret and only one ongoing case that one. Everything that was put in place during my mandate was turned upside down. First of all, I was an operational president, meaning I would spend 350 days a year between the Geneva and Paris offices and traveling. I would attend a few Grand Prix, but would travel around the world visiting the clubs. I think the only country I never visited was Eritrea." Well, 
I would like to see Monsieur Jean Todd provide MCI proof positive that he was in Burkina Faso and Pago Pago. What say you, amigo, amigo? I've gotten a card from Burkina Faso a number of times from my older brother. So it's not unheard of, but, you know, Jean Tut is a worldly kind of guy, but I think the whole thing is hilarious. And I thought Jean Tut did a wonderful job, and it's weird how all of a sudden the FIA have a $20 million deficit. This is unheard of. And what kind of other secrets are the FIA hiding? And my my favorite news is now the FIA want to walk into F1 team's headquarters unannounced and inspect. And inspect what? Books? What do you think? Books, toilets, you know, the works. Well, some of that, I believe, is still going on. But, you know, this whole thing has become so political, so complicated, absolutely over-the-top regulated that, you know, it's like when you watch a race, even before the race starts, you have to wonder, well, so-and-so qualified second, is he getting any penalty or not? And when the race finishes... Oh, somebody crossed the white line, somebody crossed this line. It's just ridiculous, you know. They should go back to the way it used to be in the 70s, especially 79 and the 80s. Let the boys fight it out. And, you know, what goes around comes around. And We've seen this in life and we've seen this in racing. Unless you do a like a super Paul Tracy or a Maldonado move, that's another story. But, man, this, uh, you know, remember once... Um, Max passed uh, Kimi Raikkonen at, at Texas. He, he 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 was I think twice removed from the from the green room before the podium ceremonies, if I recall correctly. And we don't need that. So and this kind of uh, my take is with all that's going on with Mohammed bin Sulayem, and I don't know the guy. I have nothing against him. I have nothing for him. Uh, he is just another FIA president. But you know all these things that are happening, especially the Toto and Susie uh, Wolf uh, shenanigans they pulled out that they started an investigation without checking anything and then canceling it within 48 hours. Um, I will be surprised if this guy keeps uh, stays in office till his term is over because, uh, you know, once I saw those nine teams putting out the same word for word that we did not make any complaint, uh, it just looked very, very bad uh, at for FIA. And, of course... Kaka rolls downhill, but when they start shooting back, they normally aim for the top, if you know what I mean. As do. Yes, so that's the way it is. Okay, sir, so now we go on to the Don Henley file. Kick him under up, kick him under down. Yes, the name game. This is, I mean, absolutely ridiculous. Say hello to Steak F1 Team Kick Sour. I mean, what do you make of this name? What do they call? What are they going to call this uh, during the race broadcast? Obviously, they'll, they're just going to go back to Sauber. I mean, who are they trying to please with that name? Because the name, it, I mean, you got to come up with something that rolls off the tongue, that's poetic, that's smooth and wonderful. This is just gibberish, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and the stake. This company, um, I think this is the parent company or the one of this. Either it's the parent company or the other outfit is called Medium Rare. So that was very cute, Medium Rare Steak. That, uh, you know, Medium Rare Steak Sizzling Sauber would be very nice, but this is ridiculous. But anyway, the Team Sauber has revealed a new name for the 2024 20, and 25 seasons. At uh, 26, there'll be simple Audi. Online gaming company Steak will remain as a sponsor, but the chassis will be known. This is interesting. Chassis will be known as Kick Sauber. 44C. <laughs> All Sauber cars have C in their names, which is for Christine, who happens to be Peter Sauber's wife. I am guessing he needed her express written consent to go racing. And Kick.com co-founder Bijan Tehrani said, and I quote, Kick has seen tremendous growth since its inception and is continuing to make waves in the streaming industry. Kick's content is fast-paced and engaging like what we witness every Grand Prix weekend, end quote. According to one publication, by the way, this outfit uh, is based in Australia. According to one publication, the team's new name sounds like a newspaper headline, which is uh, interesting. Okay, and there were a lot of other comments people did, so for time consideration, I would skip on those. But Mr. Rogers, the global reach of Formula One is incredible. 
I have seen the name Zeba Foods on the wings of Alpha Tauri. A 30 second Google search revealed the company is a you know dry fruit company based in of all the places in this world Afghanistan. Too bad they did not name the team Tora Bora Alpha Tauri. What say you? It is amazing. I mean, I mean, a, a company like that, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, all companies from any country deserve respect and uh, success. I wish them all the success in the world. But who found who? Does Alpha Tori find this Afghanistan fruit company or do they find Alpha Tori? It's very interesting. And I wonder how the relationship is. I want to know the deep, deep stories. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, when I saw the name ZIBA Food, it was on the front wing panel of the Alpha Tori car. Just by the new uh, name, I knew it was from part of the world I come from. So I looked it up and I just could not believe. Uh, I know Af Afghanistan is very well known for dry fruits uh, and they are very good. But I had no idea they would be on a Formula One car. And like you said, hey, we wish everybody all the best. So very, very good. If Durex and Penthouse can be a sponsor in uh, Formula One, dry fruit company should not be an issue. Exactly, especially if they're dried poppy fruits. Uh, very nice, very nice. <laughs> okay, sir, now we take the exit from Afghanistan to go into Daytona. F1 alumni is at Daytona next month. Some of the drivers with F1 pedigree who will be taking part in the 2024 Daytona 24 hours next month include Felipe Nasser, Sebastian Bordi, Marcus Eriksson. Catch of the day presented by Red Lobster will be JB, Jensen Button. He recently signed to do a full season of VEX series with Jota Porsche team. And plus we have at Daytona, Paul Di Resta. And let's not forget, he is the cousin of who? Dario Franchitti. Yes, sir. Very good. And our feature interview is with Lando Norris, which is coming up soon. And Lando Norris lands Lorenzo Bendini Award. The award is not based on result, but how a driver approaches racing as well as their character. I'm surprised we never had Danica Patrick uh, get this award since it involves character. But that's another story. Norris received a ceramic replica of Bandini's Ferrari 312 in Bandini's hometown of Prisigella in Emilia, Romania, region of Italy where Imola is located. Lorenzo Bandini was born in a town called Barce in the province of Cirenaica, which is in the nation of, believe it or not, Libya. He was killed in a fiery accident at Monaco late in the 1967 race. There is a photo of his teammate Chris Amon driving past Bendini's burning Ferrari, which says a lot about how the sport was back in the day. The show must go on. And Mr. Rogers, speaking of uh, Lando Norris, there is a lot of talk. He will go to Red Bull. He will go somewhere else. What do you see him in the near future after a cup when his contract is up as McLaren? It's possible. I think he's been contacted by Christian Horner. Uh, I see Christian going with with a young whippersnapper like that much easier than a, a Fernando or an LCH. Yes, they don't want cage rattling, that's for sure. Okay, speaking of show, Carol King continues to perform at Alpine. I feel the earth move. One of your favorites, right? Indeed. Oh, thank you. You may ask yourself what's new at Alpine. The answer is same as it ever was. Another high-profile departure. Alpine has announced their racing director, Davide Brivio, has left the building after three years with the Renault-owned team. Brivio, who was born in Monza, joined Alpine after enjoying success in MotoGP with Yamaha and Suzuki. And the rumor mill is that he is heading back to the MotoGP paddock and we wish him well. The way things are going at Alpine, pretty soon all the top aces will be gone and Luca Di Meo will have to flip the record and listen to It's Too Late Baby. Mr. Rogers, where is the road and Luca Di Meo leading Alpine to? You know, I, I have concerns, of course, and I even look into the, some of the French publications like Otto Hebdo and uh, I don't see any secret news, but... The, the interesting thing is Renault has offered Andretti another crack at a contract, so it doesn't mean 
that they're leaving F1 anytime soon, but I'd like to see a bigger, more exciting effort. Get rid of the crap. Let's bring back Prost. He knows what he's doing. And let's have a go. Exactly. Next, we move forward to freight forwarding on DHL. They are the logistics partner of Formula One and also have a heavy presence in IndyCar racing. Their slogan is Excellence Delivered. For 2024, they are delivering excellence and sponsorship to Chip Ganassi Racing, moving away from Andretti Autosport. DHL has been sponsoring Mikey's team for over a decade, and during this partnership, the highlight was Ryan Hunter Ray winning the 2014 Indy 500, which was a very impressive win. The yellow and red colors of DHL will now be on the car of Muy Macho Hombre de España on this side of the pond, Senor Alex Palou. He will need all the sponsorship and bonuses from his sponsor and team as Zach Brown and his McLaren posses are coming after him for a fistful of dollars. Whether the end result is good, bad or the ugly, time will tell. And just a note on uh, DHL. They were started in San Francisco as a business document delivery service between San Fran and Honolulu by three partners whose initials are the basis of the company's name. And today DHL is owned by Deutsche Post and they are pretty big um, internationally. And you know, they uh, were also sponsoring Jamie Chadwick, uh, who is and will stay with Andretti Racing for Indy Next, the Indy Junior Series. And they have also announced that they will still continue to support her, even though she's with the Andretti team. So that's good for her. Your two Deutsche marks on this uh, DHL thingy? Yeah, I love DHL, and that's a great success story that you mentioned. Didn't know that, but very, very cool. No, I'm happy for them. The DHL colors are, are really synonymous with IndyCars uh, for the past number of years. It's a classic, and they've had uh, a number of famous drivers, so... I'm happy for IndyCar. And you know, it was many years ago, but one of the partners, and I don't know if it was D or H or L, anyway, he had made a lot of money. He moved to like Saipan or Philippines, and he was killed in a private plane crash. And the funny thing was, after he was killed, there were like multiple young ladies, teenage and early 20s, uh, filing in a uh, claim that, oh, he's the father of my son, he's the father of my uh, daughter. But, you know, boys will be boys. Shall we move on to our new segment, sir? Please, let's keep it family-friendly. Yes. Well, we're going to go into a purple haze. This is the story of racing pilots who thought they would reach new heights in the best car on the grid, only to be shocked like a monkey by the performance of their teammate, who turned out to be the 800-pound gorilla of Grand Prix motor racing. We shall start with one of the most famous cases, the Shumi Shuffle. Move it to the right takes all night. That's what Eddie Irvine and Rubens Barrichello found out as teammate to Michael Schumacher at Ferrari. Eddie and Shumi both joined Ferrari in 1996. In the opening race of the season in Australia, Eddie was faster than Shumi and was on the podium in third while his teammate was DNF. This turned out to be Eddie's only podium of the season, and he finished 10th in the championship with 11 points. I must say he did suffer from 11 DNFs in 16 races. Michael, on the other hand, won three races, including drowning the competition in the rain in Spain for his first victory, riding a prancing horse. If anyone has not seen this race, it is highly recommended to witness what sheer brilliance is all about as we saw 19 times this season. The real embarrassment for Eddie, which I was watching with my friend, we just could not believe, came in winning the 1999 Malaysian Grand Prix. This was the comeback race for Michael after breaking his legs at the start of the British Grand Prix. Listen to this, Mr. Rogers. Michael not only outqualified him by almost a second, but slowed down not once but twice to let Eddie pass for the lead and the win. Eddie was fighting for the championship with McLaren's Mika Hakkinen. After Sepang, the final race of the season was at Suzuka, where Eddie lost the championship to Mika by two points. As Matt Bishop pointed out to me, had Irvine won the championship, he would be the first world champion without a single pole position to his name, and that would have been very, very embarrassing. 
Now, one thing I do admire about Eddie Irvine was his honesty. He was once asked by Peter Windsor, what will it take to beat Michael Schumacher? Eddie's instant and very true answer was, he has to stop going so bloody fast. Today, Eddie is minting money in Miami real estate. Sir, would you have any uh, comments on Eddie Irvine versus Shumi at uh, Scuderia Ferrari? Yeah, I mean, those are that's great memories. Uh, a classic number two, Eddie embraced it. Yeah, and he's a funny guy. He always had interesting comments. I miss those days, Nasser. Then came Rubinho. He came with great junior formula resume and high praise from Jackie Stewart. But against Michael, he ran into a brick wall. Mate, mate. In their first year together at Maranello, Michael won the first of his five consecutive championships in 2000 with nine wins. Barrichello's only success that season was in Germany, Danke shown to a disgruntled Mercedes employee. We just cost a Larry, few pence. Look, we've got a, a strange guy on this, walking down the side oh, of the God. racetrack in a raincoat on the grass. And what on earth is he doing? Crossing the racetrack during the Grand Prix. And uh, clearly either a bit too much beer there or he's hit his head on something because he's not being sensible at all. I don't, I've never seen this before. In 2001, Barrichello did a bow toss, failed to win a race while his teammate won the championship with nine wins. Final score, Schumacher 123 points, Barrichello 56. In 2002, Rubens raced to four wins and third in the championship. His teammate recorded 11 wins and matched Fangio's record of five championships. In the 2002 season, there were only two non-Ferrari wins, Malaysia, where Ralph Schumacher won for Williams BMW, and Monaco, where then local resident DC, David Coulthard, was the winner for uh, McLaren. Now we move on to the 2003 championship, another title for the Red Baron with six wins and 93 points. Rubinho had two wins, Silverstone and Suzuka finished fourth in the championship with 65 points. The final countdown for the championship run of the Red Baron, Rubinho finally finished second in the championship behind his teammate. Final score, Michael 148 points, Rubinho 114. Race wins Michael 13, listen to this, including 12 of the first 13 races, Rubinho 2. So basically it really translates to if you give the best driver of the day the very best car, winning 19 races, 12 of the first 13, it's not very hard for them. Do you concur, sir? I do concur. And, <laughs> I mean, it was definitely Schumacher's team, the Bridgestones. Everything was made for Schumi in those days. All the testing they had. I mean, it was just, it's a glorious era. Yeah, it, it, those were funny days, and Shumi was the master. He was, how do you say it, the dominator of that era as Max is today. So the question has to be asked, was Michael really that good or just lucky? Well, he was very lucky because he put a great team. I mean, it was called the Dream Team. You know, the Bulls, it wasn't just Michael Jordan. It was the, the Scuderia of the Bulls. So it does take a big team to make things happen. And Schumacher had one of the best teams ever in Formula One. Let's face it, with Jean Tut, who we hear from a lot these days. Yes. Now we move on to Hammer Time. Can't touch this. Records are meant to be broken. This was sound advice given to Mick Schumacher by his papito. I don't think anyone ever thought Michael's record of 91 Grand Prix wins will ever be broken. This was 40 more wins than second place Le Professor. Many thought Michael was end all and be all of a racing driver. His desire, determination, commitment, work ethic, fitness was second to none. All very true. Some thought Michael was walking on water and Jägermeister. Then came in Albert Park 2007 what turned out to be Ron Dennis's Project 44. And here we are today. LCH has same number of championships as Michael, thanks to another Michael. More pole position and race wins than Michael Schumacher. Lonely at the top. Hamilton had two Finnish drivers as teammates who, despite being well-dressed and groomed by the Helsinki formula, were subjected to that sinking feeling you get when a goat is grazing on the other side of the garage. 
In 2008, Lewis won the first of his seven championships by winning five races and scoring 97 points. His teammate from Sumulsami in the north of Finlandia, Heike Kovalainen, heard welcome to the world of winning from Mr. Ron Dennis only once. And this was thanks to a late race done blowed up on Massa's Ferrari. And you know everything's co-joined. Maybe that's what cost him the 2008 championship. But that's another story for someone else's glory. Kobe finished the 2008 season 7th in the championship with 53 points. Man, your teammate winning and your Phoenix finishing 7th, that is not good. Okay, now we come to LCH's second finished teammate, Valtteri Bottas, who in 2018 did a Mark Webber, did not score a win while his teammate grabbed the championship with 408 points and 11 wins. Bottas finished 5th with 247 points. Jensen Button, who was teammate to LCH after winning the championship with Braun GP, had this to say, and I quote, On a bad day, Lewis is still very, very quick. End quote. And folks, that was part one of Purple Haze. We will let Jimmy take over again next podcast for more of the same. Sir, we move on to other news and looking ahead. This was interesting. Five-time Dakar Rally winner is, uh, you know, Nasir al from Qatar will join Sebastian Loeb from your Shangri-La, Francia, in a Dacia lineup for the 2025, not next year, but 2025 edition of this event. So this is very interesting. And Dacia is a car brand from the land of Dracula and part of the Renault Group. So Mr. Uh, Luca Di Meo is trying to win in WEC, he's trying to win in Formula 1, and let's see if he can get a victory with Sebastian Loeb and Nasser al in Dakar. Any comments on this, senor? Very exciting. Everybody loves Dacia. Dacia is the company that keeps an older model. It keeps making it, just like the Volkswagen bug at Brazil. They kept making it until... I think until the 2000s, but a uh, great little company. It's a reliable little car, and I'm happy for Loeb. I think it's a great, great team, and uh, it's another dream team in, in the Dakar Rally. They're just getting a little old, but these days, you know, these old guys, it's, it's everybody's Mark Martin now. Yes. Okay, next, ZZ Top in Madrid. Headstrong Zinedine Zidane, who is also an Alpine ambassador, Last week hosted Alpine drivers in Madrid and gave them a tour of Real Madrid Stadium and later they all took part in a karting and football match. A lot of lovey-dovey going on there. Let's hope we don't see Michel Platini as new team principal at Alpine F1. You never know this day and age. And with that, sir, shall we take some Evian water break? You mean naive, spelt backwards? Exactly. There you go. Absolutely, Nasser. So why don't we take a quick break? And we'll be back after these brief messages. Hi, I'm Juan Pablo Montoya, and you're listening to F1 Weekly. Welcome back to F1Weekly.com. Clark Rogers here, your host. And now, as we spin the globe and go around the world with Motorsports Mondial, with the king, the sultan himself, Nasser Hamid. Yes, sir. Thank you. And what we're going to do is go back a few years in time where Fernando Alonso was racing at Daytona and his teammate was it then young, Lando Norris. And Lando Norris impressed Mr. Alonso a lot with his driving and speed, especially in the rain. And we had a very nice opportunity to sit down in the uh, Zach Brown motorhome and have a nice conversation with uh, Lando Norris at that time. It was a lot of fun. So uh, hopefully our listeners will enjoy this trip down memory lane. Okay, folks, I'm here at Daytona with a rising superstar of Formula One soon, Mr. Lando Norris. Lando, good to see you again. How the heck are you? <laughs> I'm very good, thanks. How are you? Very good, thank you. I have to say, welcome to the colonies. What is your first impression of Daytona International Speedway and the American racing scene? It's pretty cool. It's very different to the UK and Europe. It's a whole different experience to come out to America for the first time ever. In a different car, different team, new track. So it's a uh, yeah, new experience, but at the same time, I think it's one of the best places to, to come. So, um, yeah. 
Now, when you say big difference in European racing scene, what is the first difference you notice? Well, I don't think it's just the track. I think the whole experience out here in America. I don't know. It seems more, much more relaxed than Europe. And, of course, just coming to Daytona, it's an oval. I've never been to an oval track before. Actually, I have. Rockingham. I've been to Rockingham. So. But none where they, they, you know, they currently race. So uh, there's quite a few things which, which make it very different to, to the UK. But I think it's, it's cool for that reason. Great. Now, winning is always the goal for any racing driver. What is the objective here at Daytona in the 24-hour race? I'm not too sure. I think, I mean, yeah, I would love to win or be on the podium at least. Um, of course, you only really come to Daytona to win. But um, at the same time, we've we've struggled quite a bit with the car this weekend uh, and the whole of the raw test. So we're not in very good shape for the race in terms of um, car-wise, the balance and everything is uh, nowhere near where we need it to be. Um, we yeah, we've we've struggled a lot and um, we've found it very hard to progress and make any progress with uh, the car balance. Um, we've basically tried everything and it's not really worked. So um, it's kind of changed our expectations of where we, we think we can be, basically. Um, but in the end of the race, it's it's always hard to say, I think, at Daytona because, you know, you have all the safety cars all the way around. So you could be four laps down and still win the race. And... Uh, yeah, it's basically, you know, trying to survive until the final safety car when everyone can be on the on the lead lap again. And uh, it's basically a sprint race from, from then to the end. So, uh, yeah, it's different, but I think you can only really tell in, you know, hour 22, hour 23, who's in contention for, for the win. Okay. Uh, one of your teammates is a chap by the name of Fernando Alonso. Uh, are you going to uh, expect some learning from him, or are you going to show him how good you really are? Um, Let's hear the truth now. <laughs> you can throw him under the bus. <laughs> no, I think it's a good opportunity for me to learn a lot from him because of his experience. Um, he has very different kind of views and everything because of because of the the experience he has. Um, and you get to know, you know, what a driver needs to be like, uh, what traits a driver needs to have for a Formula One driver. So I kind of know a lot more now of which areas I need to improve on, um, you know, how to approach the race weekend, how to to push the team forward throughout the race weekend. Uh, and I've seen that part a lot of him this weekend because we've struggled. So I've seen a lot of how he's trying to help the team. Uh, be better and what things to try and whatever so um, there's a lot of things I can learn but at the same time I want to see what I can do against him but um, it's not so much about that because you know it's, it's a team game and uh, I'm here just to, to enjoy it I'm not here just to try and beat my teammates or anything so um, yeah one thing you can learn from him if the car is not quick you can scream GP2 engine <laughs> yeah I can <laughs> uh, remember that I remember, yeah, Suzuka. Yeah. But, um, that was classic. Yeah. Uh, no, he's, but Fernando's a nice guy. And he has the funny side of him all the time, so uh, you can see where that comes from. Um, but I don't think that's the. I don't think that's one of the things I need to be learning from him. Okay. Okay. We first met when you were in MSA Formula. Since then, in three years of single seater racing, you have won five championships, all in first attempt. Question is, how much is the car and how much is the driver in this success? Uh, it's all the driver. That's what I thought. <laughs> um, no, it's been quite a. Um, Teammates are important too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's. Uh, no, it hasn't been just the driver because um, I think together, like last year with Carlin, we we didn't start off in the best of ways. We started off pretty good, but uh, you know we weren't the favourites or anything. But not just because of me, but because of um, Ferdinand, Jayan, Jake Dennis. In the beginning of the season, we improved a lot and became much stronger uh, going into the mid part of the season and towards the end. So, not all it has been me. I think. If I didn't have the three other teammates that I had, who were always so fast, we could always push each other and help develop the team so much, um, I think it would have been extremely tough to, to win the championship in the end. So it definitely hasn't all been me. I still beat my teammates. So uh, 
I still had to do things better. But at the same time, if yeah, if I didn't have my teammates and the team around me, then I probably wouldn't have been able to do what I did. So uh, sometimes you need to have a, a good team and good people around you to, to still do well. Last year I went to Po to see you in action. I had a very strong feeling you will win the Grand Prix and you almost pulled it off. Uh, tell us about the race on Sunday and how long it took you to recover from the DNF disappointment, even though it was not your fault, or so I think. Whoa! Wow! Uh, not many, many views on that. <laughs> um, you can it, take a joke, right? <laughs> yes, of course. It's, uh, it's still something I'm a bit annoyed about, to be honest, because... Still. I wanted to win, yeah, because I wanted to win for the team. I think for myself, it would have been it would have been a cool place to win. The team won it the year before, so it would would have been nice to to do it for a second year. And uh, we had the pace quite quite easily to to be able to do it. But obviously, we had the the suspension failure, so it put me out of the race, which was very frustrating. I think you know I had pole by half a second or something, so. I don't know. I think it would have been very nice to win. A lot of people say different things about it, that I was taking too many risks and whatever, but uh, I was generally quite comfortable. I could have pushed more and, and put away more, but I was doing all I had to do to to pull away and stay in front. And it was just a shame that, you know, I hit the curb perfectly wrong, uh, landed and, and had the failure. So it wasn't the fact that, you know, I was hitting the curb is every lap more than everyone or uh, hit the barrier or anything it was just unlucky and therefore I didn't win but uh, yeah I, I still kind of not dwell on it but get annoyed that, that I didn't win for the team You know you won the Formula Renault Euro Cup with Josef Kaufmann team I've known him for many years and also uh, Lars Josef yeah. was telling me at Poe actually and he introduced me to your dad that when Lando finishes second he is mad as hell are you really like that? <laughs> Yeah. Can you handle a second place? That's what I want to know. It depends the situation. You know, if I come from last or something, then mm-hmm. I can deal with a second. But if it was possible to win, and there was a chance of me of doing a move somewhere, or if I made a mistake and then finished second or something, I hate it because, uh, yeah, I shouldn't have made the mistake that I that I did, or I should have gone for the move that I needed to do to win or something. So I do get quite annoyed with myself. If I, if I don't do something right on track and uh, yeah, then I'm not the, the happiest of people off the track after the race. Now, let me give you a po- positive spin on this. Better to make a mistake in F3 than in F1 because, you know, somebody made a mistake at Monaco 1988. Remember that? No. While leading? Yeah. Yeah, by a big margin. Yeah. Yeah, it was miles ahead. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, okay. I guess it happens in yeah. racing. Yeah. Um, okay, last year you had what Lewis had two years ago, quite a few slow getaways. Were you and the team able to figure out what was the reason behind that? The or was, was it the, uh, Ferdinand is looking at you? Was it the driver? Uh, yeah, it was. It was me, actually. <laughs> really? Um, Good data. Good start data. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I literally... I don't know why. I, w- I would always do something wrong, and it wouldn't be always be the same thing. I would... Um, yeah, every time I'd just do something wrong, release the clutch too fast, too slow, uh, not have enough preload, too much preload, do the preload too early, do it too late, I don't know. And um, I always seem to, to get it wrong. But by, like, Spa, uh, I got it right, and then my starts were, were very good. So it was quite annoying. It cost me a lot of points. It cost me some wins, some podiums, which, you know, could have made my life much easier in the championship by the end, so... No, but the team helped me a lot to go through everything. You know, I went to the workshop, I went through things to, to try and improve, which I did in the end, and therefore it then helped me to, to win the championship. But if I did it from the start, of course, it could have been a, an easier win in the end of the day. But uh, it was, yeah, I just I guess I made it a challenge for myself. Okay, I watched the Macau Grand Prix on the web. Uh, what an amazing final lap. Tell us about the circuit and that final lap. Uh, well, it wasn't an amazing lap for me. It was only a good lap from 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 Ferdinand. Um, I guess it didn't actually end that well. Uh, yeah, there how many corners there were, like seventeen or something. It was a good sixteen out of seventeen corners for. <laughs> no, it was it wasn't a fun race, but I don't know why. Um, for some reason, I, I really seemed to struggle. Not on pure pace because my lap, my one lap pace was 
Um, I'm quite confident to say one of the best, or the best. You know, I'd second in qualifying, and I made some big mistakes, which which cost me quite a bit of time. So I was confident I could have, you know, if I had another lap of pole, I could have uh, quite easily done it. But it was just the race pace I really struggled with, and that maybe it's because, you know, I was too aggressive with the tyres. Um, I used them too early on, or something. We never really knew so much. Um, but for Ferdinand, he drove perfectly and managed the tyres much better than than I did, and that was the reason for for him doing so well and managing to beat me, which is good for him because he's at points of the season he's done very well. Um, and sometimes been unlucky, so for him to kind of have one good race to to end the season and then go into his another season, I think was yeah it was really good for him. So it was a tough race, a tough weekend for me. But at the same time, I enjoyed it because it was my my final race in Formula Three. Uh, you should be in the Guinness Book of Records for taking the uh, longest flight to take a bath. Yeah. Tell us what happened in the Brazilian Grand Prix weekend. Well, I was home for the uh, for the race weekend, and then I flew out to Brazil to go and do the Pirelli tire test on the Tuesday uh, after the race. And I flew all the way out to Brazil. Uh, I think it was something like a nine or maybe eleven hour flight. And arrived. Uh, I went straight to the hotel um, on the Monday, and got to the hotel. You know, obviously didn't have a shower or anything on the plane, so then went to relax a bit and had a bath. Um, and while I was in the bath, I was reading, you know, the instruction manual for the steering wheel. Going in the bath. In the bath, yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, just to kind of refresh my memory a bit, and. Uh, as i was reading it i then got the call uh, i got a call on my phone from from will my engineer and uh, he says he's uh, he's got some bad news and uh, i kind of knew or thought straight away that it could be that the test was was delayed or not delayed but maybe i was doing the second day uh, but i didn't really think it's going to get cancelled but then he said it and uh, yeah, he said, you know, the test is cancelled because it's too dangerous. Probably don't want to risk anyone getting injured or anything or anyone getting hurt. So I said, okay, you know, it's it's completely acceptable because it's better for everyone to be safe rather than uh, to go ahead with one test. Put a phone down, threw the paper on the floor, had my bath, packed again, got on the first flight out to Macau, uh, which was from... Brazil to Paris, then Paris to, uh, to Hong Kong, then went Hong Kong to Macau. So it was a pretty long journey, and I literally just took that little detour, you know, to have a bath in in Brazil. So <laughs> you're right, it was one, it was a long journey to you know to go and have one bath on the way to Macau. But uh, of course, it was frustrating. I didn't do the test in the end of the day. Um, it would have been nice to, to drive in Brazil with with the F1 car and have another opportunity. But if I didn't, then I probably wouldn't have been able to drive in Abu Dhabi. So I think Abu Dhabi was a better track to do than than Brazil in terms of getting to experience an F1 car again. Now, can you tell us how many F1 teams were interested in signing you, and what made you decide to go with McLaren? Especially, you know, at that time they had Honda Power, which was unfortunately not going anywhere. Well, I don't know how many teams. We went. We didn't really talk to many teams in terms of contract or you know, wanting to join the junior program. It was more to see, uh, get to know the the guy who runs the junior program or the boss of the team. If I did join, what they could offer, um, what help you know they would they would be able to give me. What their plan would be if you know to get me into Formula One. But there wasn't really many talks on. You know, I want to sign a contract with with you. But um, with McLaren, they kind of came more to not just came to me, but both kind of came to each other and said. Uh, if we think we could we could do something and what they could offer compared to the other teams was was much better they give me more opportunities to drive the F1 car they have a better plan of getting me up and near to Formula 1 and and therefore it was the the right decision to to go with McLaren on compared to the other teams um, and they have a good history of getting the junior drivers into Formula 1 so and what was the biggest surprise first time you drove a Formula 1 car it was a bit of everything. I think the speed, you know, the braking was extremely impressive. <coughs> um, it literally feels like, you know, you're at the corner and then you brake. You don't brake and then kind of hold the brake into the corner. 
it actually feels like you know, the corner's coming up and you're braking when you're there. And uh, yeah, that took quite some time to, to really try and get used to. But um, at the same time, you know, controlling everything on the steering wheel, the, the straight line speed, the acceleration, the downforce and grip I had in the high speed um, was miles faster than anything I'd driven. So um, altogether was, was, a, was a huge, huge step up from, from Formula 3. This year you will be with uh, Carlin in Formula 2. Can you go 6 for 6? I would try to, of course. Um, you know, I would want to win. I think it will be a tough season like, like last year, especially not being the favourites or anything going into the season. Uh, going with a team who haven't raced in F2 uh, for a while. Luckily, it's a, you know, it's a new car, so everyone's on a bit more of a level playing field. But uh, I'll do what I can. To, to try and win but at the same time I try and learn as much as I can so uh, I'm as ready as I can be if I take any step up into Formula 1 yeah it's going to be a tough season no matter what so uh, I look forward to it really appreciate your time thank you so much finally how about a message for our listeners we have listeners all over the world I don't know what do you want me to say whatever you want to say F1 Weekly is the best podcast oh thank you so much check will be in the mail yeah <laughs> thank you so thank much bye bye Lando, thanks for joining F1Weekly.com. Back to you, Nats. Thank you, sir. Like father, like son. René Lammers, the Dutch karting star, is moving into Formula 4 for his first single-seater experience. He is the son of Jan Lammers. Jan is now the boss man at Zandvoort Circuit. He used to be team principal of Team Netherlands and even JP Series and took part in 23 Formula 1 races. And you know, before we met Mr. Rogers, both of us were at the A1GP race at Laguna Seca when there was snow and more participants than spectators. And I had the opportunity during lunch to have a brief chat with the Jan Lemmers. You remember that race, right? How could I forget? It was freezing, it was snowing, but it was fun. Yes, sir, that it was. And then they never came back to that circuit, but that's the way it goes. Okay, sir, more of the same. The second coming of Monty. Sebastian Montoya will continue next season in Formula 3 with a different team. After his wings were clipped by the master barber, Dr. Marco, he will switch to Campos Racing from High Tech Team. Sebastian is a cool kid raced in Miami FLA, but he is not as hot as... Papito JPM on the track. Seb was 16th in this year's Formula 3 championship. And I think in a few years we're going to see him race here in Indy Lights or Indy Cars. And now folks, we come to a moment in motorsports history. Today we will talk about the 1964 Rand Grand Prix. Just like Jim Clark's name was synonymous with Colin Chapman and Team Lotus, the name of Triple World Champion Jackie Stewart has been synonymous with Ken Tyrrell and his racing team from a lumber yard in Surrey, England. Jackie's first championship victory came at Monza in 1965 driving for BRM, and all three championships were achieved driving for Uncle Ken. In many interviews since then, Jackie has said that he did not like to drive for Lotus as their cars were falling apart and drivers were getting injured or killed, which is very true. However, Jackie's first Formula 1 race was in a Lotus, the non-championship 1964 Rand Grand Prix at Kailami in South Africa. The race took place on December 12, 1964 and was run in two heats, 25 laps per heat. Jackie Stewart started his Formula 1 career in style from pole position. His car failed on the grid and Graham Hill won with Mike Spence in second. On May 7, 1968, in practice for the Indy 500, Spence was killed in his turbine STP Lotus. He was replacement for Jim Clark who had lost his life at Hockenheim a month earlier. Going back to the Rand Grand Prix, Jackie Stewart won the second heat at Kailami, but Damon's daddy came second to claim the overall victory. In the overall results, Graham Hill's Brabham was powered 
by a BRM engine and of course he will stay winner and the top three cars were Brabham with three different engines. Second place Brabham of Paul Hawkins was powered by a Ford engine. Now Paul Hawkins was a driver from Melbourne, Australia. In the 1965 Monaco Grand Prix his car went into the harbour just like Alberto Ascari in 1955 and Paul Hawkins was killed in an accident at Alton Park in 1969. Third place Brabham driver Bob Anderson was powered by yet another engine manufacturer, Climax. And this driver lost his life after a testing accident at Silverstone in 1967. Any comments on these uh, historical events, sir? Wonderful history and information, Nasser. Outstanding. It's just great stuff. I, F1 history. It's too bad we don't have an F1 channel that has the lap of the gods on every morning like cartoons. Yeah, you know, Speed Vision tried to do that, but then they were bought out by Fox and turned into a NASCAR freak show. But hopefully, you know, one of these days somebody will wake up and say, you know, heck, what we need here is a damn F1 program network, and that's when it will happen. Maybe Liberty Media will start there. Now, you know, speaking of Liberty Media, now more and more reports are coming that they are hell-bent on having a race in New York City. New York City? Yes, this stuff's made in New York City. And I think they have a lot of money behind them, and I think they will pull it off. The uh, mayor of New York, uh, he's proposed, they don't want to, Liberty wants a race around, you know, downtown Manhattan, around Central Park, uh, but he's proposing some island a few miles away. I just cannot see a race in uh, downtown New York City, just so busy. But uh, it will be nice if they can have... The New Jersey location was very good because you can still see the Manhattan skyline. Would you like to see race number four in the U.S. of A, senor? Sure, why not? The only thing... Yeah, I mean, you could piss off people in Las Vegas, but I'm telling you, you don't want to piss off people in New York. Oh, no, then you'll be discovered on the waterfront. Cement overshoes. Yes, absolutely. Okay, sir, so that should do it for this week. We would like to thank the year is coming to an end. A season has already ended. All the wonderful folks of the F1 Weekly Familia, without them, this will not be happening. So we are very thankful. Every podcast, every year. And we now come to Musical Montial. We present a little more of 60 seconds to what from the mind of Morricone. Thank you for listening and please enjoy. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>